you do, buddy? We're coming to get you. And then you'll get your balls to the wall, man. <laughs> Welcome, folks. This is the Balls to the Wall Freakers Ball Type Show here on a Friday night. I'm Grimnir. Moose Girl's out on the town tonight, you know. She she went she went off to see a band. Uh, she, they're, they're called The Last Revel. I, I don't really know what that means, The Last Revel or The Last Revel, whatever, at a, ba- a place called The Plus. And, and tonight, today, December 13, 2019, is Moose Girl's birthday. So, hope you're having a great time out there, Moose. Happy birthday. Absolutely. Uh, enjoy yourself. It's later than you think. <laughs> anyway, we're live tonight here on RealLibertyMedia.com on the Freakers Ball show page. Also over there on Vaughn.live slash Real Liberty Media. That is the video streaming source for this program and the Freakers Ball, of course. Uh, but we're also live on the audio stream, which goes out all over the place. Uh, real RLMRadio.xyz for one, to be sure. Uh, also, we're embedded over there on realliberty.org and freedomsnetwork.com. And we have uh, players out there uh, sharing the audio stream in all kinds of other spots. So if you're audio streaming us, welcome, welcome, welcome. But head on over here to the chat and say hi and howdy to the folks that are here. And you can, uh, while you're in here, uh, make song requests for the show. Um, and and also you can uh, say hi, to, you can talk to the people about stuff that I may talk about here during the show here tonight. And it's a good old time. Uh, by the way, uh, next uh, Friday evening uh, will be the 20th of December, which is the last show prior to the Christmas holiday. But more important than that, it's also the day before the official start of winter and the winter solstice, which coincide, obviously. <laughs> They're pretty much one and the same there, but uh, for those solstice celebrators, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there's that. Uh, so uh, next Friday. So anyway, if you want to make uh, requests to celebrate the season, whatever it is you celebrate. Now I, I'm not really sure if there's any um, Kwanzaa songs. <laughs> But, but apparently, according to my calendar here, Kwanzaa is the 26th, or the the first day of Kwanzaa. I I, I don't know how I, I don't know much about Kwanzaa. Uh, and then there's that other one that uh, what was that one they made up on on Seinfeld, Pole Day or something like that. <laughs> Maybe you got something for that. I don't know what. Well, whatever it is, if you celebrate anything and you wanna hear a song about it on next Friday's show. Get your requests in before the next Friday show. All we, we, we do have several, many requests already uh, of a holiday nature. So uh, hooray for that. Um, and additionally, the week after that, which will be the 27th of December, will be our annual prediction show uh, where people have made predictions and can still make predictions uh up until that show and we'll we'll share with you last year's predictions and how well they went and then we'll we'll show you this year or the predictions for the coming year um so get those predictions in before the show uh also uh i'll i'll be leaving the prediction deal open uh until the fo- following friday which will be the 3rd of january 2020 um, so, <laughs> are there, yeah, there's, uh, uh, Vinny's asking if there's any Hanukkah songs. Well, I, all I know is the Adam Sandler Hanukkah song, um, which is kind of like for Thanksgiving. The only Thanksgiving song I know is, 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 uh, uh, Adam Sandler thanks turkey, turkey song. <laughs> I'm sure there are others. I just don't know them. Um. Uh, but there are some for for the uh, solstice, and there are many, many, many for for Christmas. So uh, just bear those in mind. Anyway, let me say hi and howdy to the folks that are here in the chat. Let's the, the, the chat that I mentioned a little while ago. Come on over, jump on into the chat. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, you can talk to all the great folks that are here tonight. We got some great folks. We always got great folks. We got the barman. You can talk to barman. He may or may not respond, being he's just a bot. And sometimes he responds to things, and sometimes he don't. <laughs> we got Beetle and Cowboy Tech, who uh, was putting your neck out. It was kind of like balls to the wall. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe. I mean, if you line up the guillotines at that time, when the slaves take control, and the slaves, I'm talking about you and I and the rest of us, yeah, well, when, when, when we take it all back, then, uh, yeah, putting your neck out may be a thing. And it could be a guillotine. It could be a rope. We don't know. Something. <laughs> they may just get their balls to the wall in front of a firing squad. Anyway, there's uh, myself and Miss Kate there. Uh, hey, Kate, how you doing? Um, Aunt I and Asmo and Chalcedonia, Echelon. Gramzy, hey Grammy, how the hell you doing? Oh, never mind. I, I was I, I got distracted for a moment. We got the Java Doctor and Meester Meister Woody Brow, uh, the Poopster and the Prince. They did their show last night with Doctor Death. Doctor Death <laughs> was their special guest last night on the Power Hour. <laughs> we got Mister Rob works here tonight in Rome's, uh, A.K.A. Darth. Darth no one? Darth Rooms? Well, trust no one. All right. Uh, Vanna White, yes, she's a, she's a great little bot. Uh, and uh, Vin, Vin E, the other half of the, 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 the other half of the, of the Ponder Gander. Uh, we got, we got the Phantom in CC66. Joe Scarra, this circle, who today was on Vin E's show with him. Uh, yeah, she, uh, she, she, uh, did a great job. It's always nice hearing Circle on the radio. I, I love her accent. And anyway, we got the cyborg uh, noodle of uh, Miss Damn Van Meter. How you doing, Donna? She had a birthday earlier this week. And um, I forget what she says. She turned 44. Something like that. 44. Damn. Damn Donna. Damn Donna Van Meter. <laughs> we have Da and E Man and Ensive and Frumpy the Frumpstar. He's, a, he's, a, he's that cool Canadian dude that hangs out with us. Uh, we got the Gromit and JJ's. Hey, JJ, Moose Girl's way down the list here. How you doing down there, Moose? What's, what's, what's you going incognito tonight? And we got the Pondergander himself. The Pone Sauce. The Pone Sauce. Uh, sock Puppet. Spot as Back with us again. The Holiest of Rogers. And Mr. Zepex. Zepex! <laughs> That's the crowd. That's who we got here. Oh, boy. Hola, says the Pondaganda. Um, so what do I want to tell you about this week? Was there anything interesting that happened here in beautiful Moriarty, or uh, even more specifically in my house? You know, I can't really think of nothing. It was a pretty quiet week. Nothing exciting happened. As far as I know. Okay, well that's good. Um, I, I I I don't I don't know what Vinny's talking about there. He's he's uh, just spouting numbers, random numbers. He's like one of them them number stations. <laughs> All right. Um. Anything interesting going on at RLM Radio? Oh, there is something interesting going on at RLM Radio. Happened this week. Just started on Wednesday. How could I forget? <laughs> Lonnie Clark started her new show. Well, it's not a new show. It's new to RLM. But it's an old show. And she brought it over here to, to, to be with us. So, um, thanks, Lonnie. Uh it, and, and 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 so she'll be on every Wednesday at noon Eastern, so a midday Wednesday show, which means that we have at least one show every day of the week. Now we could certainly use more than one show every day of the week, 
But we got one show every day of the week, which is cool. And say welcome to Lonnie Clark, y'all, because, you know, she, she's, she's doing a show about nukes and stuff, you know. Um, and, and she has a lot of information and a lot of knowledge in that area. And Vinny, good night, or go rest well, or whatever the heck it is. Um. <laughs> don't don't fall asleep. All right, so uh, that's I think the, the big RLM news was the new show this week. We may have more shows coming um, in the in the new year in 2020, as people will have better vision next year because everybody will be 2020, you know. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, all right, not real funny. <laughs> all right, uh, I think that's good. Why don't we uh, start playing some music here? And what, what's going on? How come my clicker's not clicking? There it is. Click, I say click. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, I didn't say hi to Chloe. Hey, Chloe, how you doing out there? Uh, always good to see you hanging around with us. Yeah. All right. Um, ba 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 ba. Balls to the wall, man. Balls to the freaking wall. Where is my camera? <laughs> uh, here we go. Enjoy. Turn it up. Woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil sends the beast with wrath. <laughs> Wah. All right, that's a band named Rage. Uh, it was a brand new one from them called Chasing the Twilight Zone. Uh, they've been around for a while. I, I'm not really all that familiar with uh, Rage, but uh, they've been around since the mid '90s. And uh, good, that, that's just plain good rock and roll there. Let me tell you. Uh, before that, we had Gary Howie covering Red Rider's Lunatic Friends, and we kicked it off with Iron Maiden. Number of the Beast. Ooh, good stuff. Uh, <laughs> well, it's I, I say it's good stuff if you if you like rock and roll. You know, I'm, I may I, I, I may tone it down a little in the uh, remainder of the sets here tonight. But uh, man, that's some good rock and roll right there. Let me tell you, it gets you get you fire up a little bit, gets you kicking, gets you moving in your chair or wherever you may be. You may not be in a chair. You may be wandering around. You might be listening on the audio stream, or actually, maybe you're watching the video stream uh, out there on the street somewhere. We, we, I, 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 I don't know. I don't have that information. Um. <laughs> and I don't really want it. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, wherever you're at, I hope you're having a good time tonight uh, here on this Friday. Full moon, Friday the 13th, Freaker's Ball Show. Uh, Freaker's Balls to the Wall Show. Yeah. yeah. It, gets, it, gets, it gets a little, uh, everything gets a little mixed up on, uh, on, the, on the Balls to the Wall Show. It's Freaker's Ball. It's Balls to the Wall. It's Freaker's Ball minus the Moose, which is, uh, you know, she's kind of like the uh, highly important factor here uh, of uh, the uh, Freaker's Ball Show. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, ain't that nice? Uh, Java Doctor here in the chat just posted a link here. Secret Santa pays off $20,000 in layways at uh, Alabama Walmart. Let's bring that up and take a look, see what it, what what he's got to say about that. Because that's a cool see, a Secret Santa there paying off twenty grand in layaways. I, I didn't even know people were still doing layaways, but I guess they are. You know, um... I guess that's a good thing to do, like if you have uh, uh, kids or something like that, uh, where where you want to get them something and you want to make sure you get it, but you don't have the cash right away. Um, I, I've done layaway stuff way in the past, but uh, just for, you know, on my own personal stuff here. Anyway, let's see what we got here. On Breitbart.com, posted uh, today, oh, yesterday, um, a generous Secret Santa paid off twenty grand in layaway accounts on, on an Auburn, Alabama Walmart on Monday morning, 
focusing on accounts with children's toys. Very nice of you, Secret Santa. Uh, WRBL reported that the Secret Santa also paid for $8,600 in gift cards to be distributed to families. Amberly Smith said she's so thankful for the surprise gift, telling WRBL that Santa surprise helps her purchase $203 worth of layaway items for her two children. I'm so thankful. We, we do all we can for our babies, and this is just such a blessing. I am so thankful to Secret Santa, said Smith. Walmart associates are calling families with layaway accounts to share the good news. When customers quietly pay off other layaway items, we're reminded how good people can be. We're honored to be a small part of the random acts of kindness, said a Walmart spokesperson. The Secret Santa is thought to live in eastern Alabama, but prefers to remain anonymous. Although, if they could name him, they would. <laughs> as the person spreads holiday cheer to children in the area. Uh, yeah, so that's great. Uh, that, that's, that's terrific, terrific stuff there. Uh, Java Doctor, thanks for sharing that article. It's, it's, it's good. It's good to see, you know, people, some people still doing nice stuff for folks out there. I, I always like to see that too. So, uh, hooray. Hooray for them. Hooray for them. Um, because <laughs> oh, you know normally the, the, the news that I pull up for the show is it's not always uh, it's not always the best of things but let me share you something that could be the best and it is while not directly holiday specific kind of holiday related uh, even though it's not a holiday show uh, we'll, we'll share this because in the next coming weeks, you may want to partake in some of this wonderful spice. And it's pretty good stuff. Um, I, I don't know what I would use it for, uh, but it's a spice that you can use for different foods. And it's called nutmeg. You ever heard of nutmeg? Yeah, I'm sure you have. Anyway, on this article here, on organicfacts.net, are 13 scientifically proven benefits of nutmeg who knew i thought it was just something to put in your eggnog to make your eggnog a little uh, tastier nutmeg is a popular spice with a long list of health benefits like relieving pain indigestion insomnia and improving brain function it extends its ability to provide hepatic protection relieve depression improve cholesterol levels, regulate blood pressure levels, and alleviate oral conditions. So, it says here, what is nutmeg? Uh, nutmeg is a spice that comes from the seed of the evergreen nutmeg tree. The, some Latin pronunciation I, or word I can't pronounce. The nut, nutmeg tree, interestingly, is a host to one more incredibly potent and unique spice. Mace, which is the reddish uh, seed covering, the dried reddish seed covering. Uh, the tree is native to Maluku, or Spice Islands of Indonesia, and is the only tree that is the source of the two dis distinct spices in the world. It is commonly grown in the Caribbean, other tropical areas of the world, and also southern India in the state of Kerala. Uh, the nutmeg spice has a pungent, yes it does, fragrance and slightly sweet taste, which is why it is widely used in cuisines around the world. Nutmeg is used and found in many forms like essential oils, powders, and extracts. While the ground nutmeg is used in many preparations like baking, pudding, uh, confections, beverages, like eggnog, pumpkin pie, and apple pie, you put nutmeg in apple pie? Okay. It is most widely used in nutmeg butter. Uh, the spice is also used in an ingredient, as an ingredient in uh, creamy and cheesy dishes like Alfredo. Okay. And then they give, give you a breakdown of the, the stuff that's in nutmeg um, there, which I'm not going to go here, through here with you. But uh, the nutritional facts of nutmeg, 
Uh, while nutmeg is only a spice that is used sparingly in dishes, it can still impact your health in a variety of ways, mainly due to its nutritive content of vitamins, minerals, and organ organic compounds related to essential oils. According to the USDA nu National Nutrient Database, the beneficial components include dietary fiber, manganese, thiamine, vitamin B6, foliate, magnesium, copper, and maselignin. Maselignin, I think that's how you say that, I don't know. Uh, the health benefits of using this, uh, it, it relieves pain. People suffering from chronic conditions like cancer, inflammatory disease, and diabetes often suffer from persistent pain. According to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, U.S. National Library of Medicine, nutmeg oil derived from the seed of the nutmeg tree has been proven to be an analgesic and chronic pain reliever. Uh, published by the Food and Nutrition Research Journal in 2016, a uh, comparative study conducted on rats, which they're always checking this on rats, so humans are kind of rat-like, I suppose, um, <laughs> showed that topical application of nutmeg oil, when compared with other pain alleviators like diclofenic, has a better effect on inflammatory pain. The state, same study shows that nutmeg oil can also alleviate joint swelling as well as mechanical allodynia, which is an intense pain caused by even a light touch. It relieves insomnia. For generations, nutmeg has been recommended as a home remedy, remedy for sleeplessness and insomnia. A pinch of nutmeg in warm milk always seems to do the trick. An uncontrolled trial by Nadu et al. was conducted on 251 patients who were administered with a nutmeg-containing herbal capsule. The patients received the capsule for four weeks regularly. All people who are participated in the research apprised that they witnessed improvements in the overall weak weakness levels and insomnia. One animal study also suggested that nutmeg extracts helped in increasing duration of deep sleep. Uh, it promotes digestion. So according to the Essential Oils and Food Pres Preservation, a flavor and safety by some guy's name I can't pronounce, uh, nutmeg is known to have medicinal properties. It has been used to treat digestive issues such as indigestion and stomach ulcers. The medicinal properties come from the unique scent of the nutmeg seed. It improves your brain health, which, hey, who couldn't use that? Uh, nutmeg is often connected with neuroprotective properties. In recent research, these efforts of nutmeg volatile oil are tested on rats. Uh, re result, results of the uh, study show that nutmeg contains volatile oils like baristersin, eugenol, and elemincin whatever, uh, all of which help increase the levels of serotonin, dopamine, and neuroephrine in the hippocampus of the rats. The hippocampus is the organ located in the brain that is mainly associated with memory and spatial navigation, which is part of the memory responsible for recording and retrieving, highly important, all of the information in the brain. I assume the recording goes on regardless. The retrieving is the tough part. Therefore, the study concluded uh, suggesting that the oils in nutmeg have a therapeutic effect on the prevention of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's or old timers, Parkinson's, and Huntington disease. Oral health, a 2012 study, suggests that nutmeg has antibacterial properties and has the potential to inhibit, inhibit the activity of bacteria such as Poramorphonis gingivalis, whatever, gingivitis, uh, which causes periodontis and streptococcus and are associated with tooth decay. Furthermore, according to the chemistry of the spice by some guy, uh, maristic acid and tremistin 
found in nutmeg also exhibit good antibacterial activity. The methanol extract found in nutmeg has anti-karyogenic properties and helps prevent tooth decay and dental caries. Um, methanolagin, whatever, another antibacterial agent found in the spice, also helps inhibit the activity of bacteria that cause cavities. Uh, liver protection, yes. Uh, nutmeg is a well-known plant with various medicinal applications, including treating liver disorders. An animal study uh, suggests that the nutmeg, rich in mersolegdan, <laughs> may help relieving liver injuries. In a study in mice, well, at least they're using mice and not rats this time. In the study, mice were administered with thiosomatamide, which is a chemical compound that causes chronic liver disease. So they gave the, the mice liver disease, uh, like fibrosis and cirrhosis, and treated with nutmeg. Nutmeg extracts helped lower the hepatic inflammation and also free radical activity in the liver. On another study on rats, suggests that miracetin, found in nutmeg oil, has hepo, hepa protective, hepatoprotective properties. <laughs> However, further studies are required to explain the benefits of nutmeg for the liver. Antidepressant properties. It is an Ayurvedic medicine. And, you know, I, I, if you've been listening to me over the recent months, you'll realize that I've discovered the wonders of Ayurvedic medicine uh, and, and have suggested several options to you on Ayurvedic medicine. Um, anyway, it, so it is a, an Ayurvedic medicine. A, a nutmeg has been treasured for a long time for its medicinal properties when it comes to depression. In a 2012 con, uh, study conducted by some guy and his team from the Alameen College of Pharmacy in Bangalore, India, it was found that nutmeg extracts demonstrated antidepressive activity. Moreover, it has fewer side effects than conventional allopathic drugs. Uh, in another study of mice, it was found the extract of nutmeg seeds exhibited antidepressive effects. Regulates blood pressure. Comprehensive guide to lowering blood pressure from the NIH. It is suggested to add more spices like nutmeg to the diet. The guide also mentions, mentions and emphasizes using less sodium in the food to keep blood pressure levels healthy. I'm not sure if that's accurate. I think that sodium thing is a little outdated and was never correct in the first place. Um, another study reported that nutmeg extracts did not exhibit any significant effect on blood pressure levels. So, yeah, yeah, what do you got to lose? Uh, <laughs> more scientific evidence is needed. It has anti-cancer potential. Um, and uh, skin care uh, potentials as well, and it lowers LDL cholesterol levels. Them's the bad ones. Them's the ones you don't want, or at least that's what they tell you. And it's also good if you've got diarrhea. Apparently, nutmeg has been commonly used throughout throughout for giving relief from diarrhea um, and uh, anticonvulsant. Anticonvulsant, a big one there. Uh, suggests, uh, a study suggests that the use of nutmeg oil may help prevent the spread of seizures. It's also indicated that this oil may be effective against both grand mal, see, where, where did I, where did I lose that thing there? Uh, grand mal and, and partial seizures. Uh, so, um, then it talks about the poisoning and, and it says if, you, if you're really taking a lot of this nutmeg, uh, you, you could have a, you could have an issue with it. But overall, uh, Christmas is the time when people break out the nutmeg, or this time of year, not necessarily Christmas, but Thanksgiving through throughout New Year's is when people break out the nutmeg for their for their um, various baking and and other food type stuff. So, hell, if you're gonna be using it, you might as well know the good good stuff it does for you. And uh, so that that there's a list from OrganicFacts.net. Nutmeg it up! Nutmeg it up! All right. <laughs> oh, don't be so nutty. All right. 
Oh, man. <laughs> I tell you. Oh, I like this story. This is a great story. And in case you have some kind of critter you want to take along with you to various places, I guess it doesn't really matter too much what that critter is. <laughs> this is posted on Sputnik here uh, yesterday. Sputniknews.com. U.S. man successfully registers beehive as a service animal. <laughs> yeah, you heard me right. A beehive as a service animal. Now, if he really did, I mean, uh, planned on doing this and taking the beehive along with him on, like, airplanes or whatever, can you imagine being the guy sitting next to him? <laughs> But that's not his goal. He, his goal is not to actually carry a beehive on the airplanes. In an effort to prove that it's too simple to register a service animal in the United States, Arizona man David Keller successfully registered a beehive for the title. Keller explained to the local news outlet CBS 5 that he was inspired to sign up the beehive as a service animal, even though... He does not really own a beehive as a pet after seeing a supposed service dog misbehaving in a parking lot. I could very easily tell that it was not a service animal because it was pulling the owner to the parking lot. Uh, Keller said before noting that a lot of people thought it was hilarious. A lot of people were getting upset. Uh, Keller managed to file his registration papers, including a photo of the supposed hive, through a website called USAServiceDogRegistration.com. There is a link to that site here in the article, but basically that's it, USAServiceDogRegistration.com. According to Jamie Carden, a service dog trainer in Scottsdale, Arizona, told the station that many service animal registration sites that exist online don't actually verify the animals being registered. They're very silly. They don't mean anything. You can go pay for a registry on one of these websites, and basically you're just paying for a piece of paper to put a name on a list, Cardin explained. Training is how you tell whether it's a service animal or not. According to U.S. federal law, namely the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, a service animal is defined as a dog that has been individually trained to work or perform tasks for an individual with disability. The task performed by the dog must be directly related to the person's disability. <sighs> Emotional support or comfort animals, on the other hand, include any animals that enhance a person's overall well-being and comfort. Since such animals... Uh, have not necessarily been trained for any particular task, the ADA does not consider them service animals, though certain state and local laws may allow their owners to bring them into public places. So get your beehive and register it up, and you can say, it gives me comfort to have this beehive along with me. <laughs> Keller hopes that by registering a beehive as a service animal, he can raise awareness of the lax standards of third-party registration sites. Uh, it's making people believe all animals are service animals when they are not. It, it's, it's, there's, there's a clear difference. Yes, there is a clear difference uh, between a beehive and a, and a, and a well-trained dog. So, uh... <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> Stoners, strippers, and scripture for Adam K. What? I did. Sometimes I, I glance back to the chat for a moment, and I, I have to say, what? <laughs> All right. All right, let's hear some jams here. I got more jams for y'all. These are, these are more, uh, not quite as metal as the first set, as the opening set. Actually, not metal at all. Well, maybe a little metal. <laughs> but uh, not not all of them. So enjoy, and, uh, and uh, I'll be back after these.
Yes, indeedy, I will. No, he couldn't slow down. <laughs> Just go tall with Joe Bonamassa doing locomotive breath, man. Oh, I love that. I love, love, love it, love it. Before that, Metallica, Sad But True, the official music video. And we kicked it off there with the Rolling Stones doing Jumpin' Jack Flash off of the film, uh, br- film slash DVD, uh, Bridges to Buenos Aires. Uh, apparently they just, uh, they just, uh, pulled that out of the archives and re-released it, uh, in November here, uh, which filmed back in 1998, uh, down there, uh, well, all kinds of places actually, but, uh, yeah, man. Good rock and roll. Yeah, Donna likes Donna likes the tall, too. <laughs> How could you not? <laughs> you know, when you when you see Ian Anderson kind of creeping across the, the stage there playing his flute, man, he's like he's taunting people with that flute, you know. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it, it's funny to see. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's, he's definitely got a way about him. Uh, you know, he wouldn't have been doing it all this, all the, all these years if, if he didn't. But, uh, man, he's, uh, that's, 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 that's some, that's some raw, raw talent right there, Mr. Jethro, Mr. E. Anderson. Well, the whole Jethro Toll band, but, uh, yeah, so, uh, dig it, man. I just dig, dig every bit of it. Uh, it's just cool, cool, cool stuff. Yep. <laughs> anyway, welcome uh, to Hansel to the chat room here. He uh, jumped in here recently uh, during that last set, I believe. Um, so uh, welcome to Hans, and I think we get somebody else. Somebody else popped in here. Uh, prince, oh yeah, hey Prince, how the hell you doing, man? Uh, buddy Prince, he is a prince, prince of prince. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> Hopefully, y'all got some good plans for the weekend, or at least, you know, yeah, you got to do something fun, uh, whether or not uh, it is uh, anything exciting. As long as you have a good time, that's all that really matters. As long as you have a good time. And hopefully, you're not in the room with this guy, um, because this would not be a good time. <laughs> Posted on the sun dot c o dot u k. I I don't want to ever be in the room with this guy. But it it could have it, you know you 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 never you never can tell, as the song goes. Oops, where did I press there? I pressed something wrong. Sometimes the figures don't exactly do what I want. So here he is, gone with the wind. <laughs> Yeah, a uh, man whose deadly farts can kill mosquitoes, that's a deadly fart, hired to create mosquito repellent made from his intestinal gas. Uh, a man whose farts can kill mosquitoes claims to have been signed up by an insect repellent company uh, probing the secret of his killer gas. Joe Ramira, 48, from Kampala, Uganda, uh, says boffins have launched a study into the chemical properties of his unique trouser toxin. Apparently, Joe is known around the city as the man to, de- do, to befriend if you're sick of mosquitoes. Joe is quick to assure people his farts are only noxious to insects. The odd job man says no one in his own village has ever contracted malaria because his powers knock out insects over a six-mile radius. <laughs> that's, that's a hell of a fart. Six-mile radius. <laughs> if true, that would make his fallout zone larger than that of the atomic bomb which destroyed Hiroshima in 1945. The local barber, or a local barber, James Yowry, said he is known all over the city as the man who can 
who could kill mosquitoes with his farts. When Joe is around, we all know mosquitoes will vanish. He is respectful of people around him and will only fart when there are mosquitoes around, which bring malaria. His farts get rid of this disease. <laughs> A local chief who knew Joe when he was growing up as a child said he took him uh, in to live with him during the malaria season and claimed no one nearby caught the disease. The chief said, I've heard about Joe's gift, and I took him in to help mop out the mosquitoes infesting, infesting our surroundings. He respectfully drops his bloomers, and it helped eradicate the insects. He does his thing, and they all drop, like flies. Joe said, I eat ordinary food just like everyone else, but no insect can lay a foot on me, not even a fly. He said, I smell like a normal man, and I bathe daily, and my, my farts are just like everyone else's. They are only dangerous to small insects, especially mosquitoes. Joe dreams of his, of, of his marketing his gas and added, I imagine buying a, a, a raid can with my face on it. Uh, claims that Joe's wind has evolved to combat malaria emerged online yesterday, but the two companies linked to him were not identified, and the claims could not be verified. Oh. <laughs> I hope it's true. I, I really, I, I really hope it's true. Uh, I, I, <laughs> That this guy's farts can kill mosquitoes. Uh, I've been around people that when they fart, it's like they could kill humans. Uh, but uh, this guy, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> All right. University of Phoenix. You ever take a class at universe, or uh, at one of the University of Phoenix outlets? Uh, anywhere around. I, I have. I've taken uh, several classes down there. Uh, they were all paid for by my employer at the time when I was employed and had an employer. And uh, they wanted me to take classes of certain types. So I did. And, and I took all of my uh, Microsoft certification classes there at the University of Phoenix, which I passed every, every, every Microsoft certification first time through, first try. Now, the classes there at University of Phoenix, eh, not really, not really much to them. The books were okay. The instructors were, uh, you know, whatever. So if you, as long as you read the books, which I guess you could probably get the books and never take the class and then just go take the certification. But it kind of got you out of work for a week or two, uh, depending on what how the classes were, were set up. Sometimes like uh, a Wednesday, one Wednesday a week. or what, I took various classes there, and I took a lot of different uh, Microsoft certifications, um, MCE, MCSE, uh, database stuff, uh, uh, SQL Server, uh, Microsoft uh, 2000 Server, uh, all kinds of various Microsoft certifications I got from them, which were useless. Let me, let me tell you, I never got one single shred of benefit from any of the Microsoft certifications that I that I acquired. Not one. Nobody ever said, "Hey, let's give you a job. You got all these Microsoft certs." Not that I was looking uh, <laughs> for one <laughs> in that field, but. People know, the employers know who's getting the Microsoft certifications, at least they could, if they wanted to. It's all publicly available, who's getting certified where, on, on what. And so I was certified on pretty much everything Microsoft had to offer, uh, as, as far as their, their various servers and technology and security and uh, database, uh, SQL Server stuff. Um, but not once, not once did I get any benefit out of uh, those certifications other than, uh, when you, when you pass the test, you go, woohoo, I passed the test. <laughs> First time through. And you look around at the other people that are there doing the search and are going, oh, I didn't get it. <laughs> so, so you get a little, you, you get a little uh, ego bump there. <laughs> 
<laughs> but outside of that, not, not, really nothing. However, that article is not about that. This article is not about that. Oh, boy. This article is about this. University of Phoenix reaches a $191 million settlement with the FTC, including debt relief. As I said, I never paid a penny, so I, I require no debt relief from them. Yeah, yeah, Donna, I, I mean, come on. <laughs> I probably would have been better off doing Cisco classes, but I didn't want to do all that networking nonsense. I mean, networking's fine, and, and I could have done it all without the Cisco certs. But, uh, yeah, I, I didn't really want to get into all that. Um, so, whatever. <laughs> anyway, the University of Phoenix is paying a record $191 million to settle a complaint filed by the FTC accusing the for-profit university of using deceptive ads to hire or to lure students with the promise of future job opportunities with large companies such as AT&T, Adobe, Twitter, Microsoft, and Yahoo! <laughs> oh, boy. The settlement includes a, a plan to cancel $141 million in student debts. Now, see, they say uh, earlier there, $191, they're paying $191 million, and this says they're canceling $141 million in student debts. So that's not really like they're paying. They're just canceling debts. That's, that's a whole different ball of wax in my view. Now, anyway, these debts that are owed to the school by people who enrolled from October 2012 through the end of 2016, a period in which the FTC says prospective students might have been duped. And let me tell you, if the rest of the people in the classes that I took are any example of the students they had during this period, they were easily duped. <laughs> Most of those people should never have been in those classes. They didn't even know how to turn a damn computer on. What the hell they were doing trying to get these certifications, I have no idea. Uh, this, these, these were not beginner classes. These were not for the novice. These were for people that already understood computers, how computers work, networks, servers. Uh, if you understood all that stuff, you could just breeze through these classes. If you didn't understand anything, you were gonna get. You were never gonna pass. You were never gonna get these certs. It didn't matter. I mean, you may be great at test taking, but uh, what they teach in the class, to so the way that the, the questions uh, on the certifications exams were worded, you needed to know what the hell you were doing. And most of those people just didn't. Uh, even a good buddy of mine, one of my coworkers that worked with me, he didn't. He never got a single cert. Uh, he was he worked in the next cubicle over for mine, and um, <laughs> I feel really bad for him, you know. But uh, eh, I, I taught him how to how to how to do some uh, uh, programming, uh, uh, VBA, Visual Basic for Applications programming, so that he could do some uh, programming to, to create some uh, access applications, uh, which he finally got got the hang of uh, in doing a lot of that stuff. Uh, but he still, he, he wasn't, you know, a computer guy. That was just not his thing. So, uh, anyway, whatever. Uh, court documents establishing, establishing the settlement give the University of Phoenix and its parent company, Apollo Education Group, I wonder if that's Apollo Creed ed Education Group, 15 business days to send an email and a letter to eligible students informing them that they're covered by the agreement. The letter's second paragraph reads, you no longer owe any money to the University of Phoenix. You do not have to do anything to get this relief. Your account balance will be cleared within 45 business days. Uh, the letter also states that the school has 55 business days to tell credit reporting agencies to delete the debt from the student's credit reports. The FTC says the university wrongly suggested that it worked closely with high-profile companies to develop its courses. And it says the school's Let's Get to Work ad campaign was one example of how it hypes connections with potential employers. Now, I'm not seeing here where it says that people that already paid off uh, all of their debts are getting their money back. Um, 
Oh, here it is. Maybe this is it. The remaining $50 million of the settlement will be paid in cash, which the FTC says will be used for consumer redress. I assume that means that you'll get your money back if you've already paid it off. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, uh, this, the same thing applied uh I, I, back way, way, way back when I, after I just got out of high school, uh, and I didn't want to go or I, I didn't have money to, to go to, uh, um, an actual college and, uh, you know, a non community college. And I didn't graduate high school because I just quit in the middle of the 11th grade because I was living on my own and I needed to work to, to support myself. <laughs> so I just quit the, the high school at the, at, uh, at, in the middle of the 11th grade. Um, didn't need it. It was useless. It was it was doing nothing for me. I could have went another year and a half and got that stupid piece of paper, which would have done me no good in my life. Not a bit of good. But um, anyway, so going to these uh, community college classes that I went to, <laughs> the, uh, the people didn't, uh, most of the people there, I don't think they were taking it seriously anyway. Um, but I took a, a few courses there. And uh, it, it was obvious that the, the, these people either didn't belong there or had no interest in what was going on there. Uh, they were just doing it for some other reason. Uh, days of use, you know. Um, <laughs> so so you, you learn things. Uh, but I took some good electronics courses there over at the, uh, what the hell is that class, that school called? Mesa, Mesa College in, uh, in San Diego. It's a community college. So... Uh, <laughs> oh man, I tell you, life life is funny. <laughs> mm. All right, this article it's a good cheery kind of article, a good uh, holiday season article for you all. Didn't happen to me. This is for a real estate company, uh, but here it is. Company surprises employees uh, with ten million dollars in bonuses at a holiday party. This is posted up on WREG.com, Baltimore, Maryland. One of the largest commercial real estate firms in the Mid Atlantic will pay a surprise ten million dollar bonus to all one hundred and ninety eight of its employees. That's a little misleading. All 198 employees are not getting $10 million. It's a $10 million split amongst 198 employees, which still not too shabby. And the announcement was caught on video. St. John Properties said it, the surprise was to celebrate the company's goal of developing 20 million square feet of office, flex, R-D, R, RD and D, retail and warehouse space in eight states. Um, the workers will be paid bonuses based on their years of service with the average employee receiving $50,000, which, hey, that's nothing to shake a stick at. I'll take fifty grand just for doing my job. Uh, you know, extra un un unexpected cash, that's a, that's a great deal. To celebrate the achievement of our goal, we wanted to reward our employees in a big way that would make a significant impact on their lives, says the company's founder Hart, uh, and chairman, Edward St. John. I am thankful for every one of our employees for their hard work and dedication. I couldn't think of a better way to show it. The bonus will be on top of the company's annual year-end bonus and other benefits. So, uh, you know who's really going to love this bonus, giving away this, this big bonus? The IRS. The IRS is going to dig them getting these bonuses. Because they're going to suck that. This will bump them up into another tax bracket. IRS is going, woohoo! <laughs> so, uh, there you are. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> Let's see what else we got here for you. <laughs> oh, I think Cowboy Tech posted this in the uh, chat last night, and I, and I found it. I don't know what I found. It's kind of humorous, but it is what it is. Um, 
I'll, I'll I'll put the picture up on the screen there for you before for a moment before I go on with the article because you're going to say, "What the hell are you showing us?" <laughs> oh man, <laughs> let me see if I can find this. There it is. All right. Now, in a moment there, in a second, you'll see what's on the screen, or probably by the time you hear this, you'll see what's on the screen. There's a guy holding something that looks weird. If you're looking at the video uh, of the deal here. <laughs> yeah. It's not a penis. It looks kind of like a penis, pretty much like a penis. But it's not a penis. <laughs> Apparently, this penis fish is called the fat innkeeper worm. <laughs> it just looks like this guy picked up a dick that he found <laughs> laying, a dick with balls attached uh, that he found laying there on the beach. <laughs> All right, here's a story from The Mind Unleashed dot com <laughs> thousands of strange penis fish awash ashore on California beach the bizarre creatures are known as the fat innkeeper worms morning visitors to Drake's Beach in Northern California last week witnessed thousands of strange 10 inch phallic fish washed up on the shore the strange creatures are known as fat innkeeper worms, and they have been spotted on other nearby beaches in California in the past. They usually watch up, wash up on beaches after storms, similar to the storm seen around Drake's Beach last week. The scientists call this creature Eurekis caupo, as it is classified as a type of spoon worm. Uh, the picture below was taken on, different, on a different occasion earlier this year, when the fat innkeepers washed up on Bodega Bay in June, uh, the photo illustrates the fat innkeeper, that's the picture you saw, um, known as penis fish. <laughs> At Drake's Beach last week, thousands of these things washed up on the beach, making it entirely impossible uh, to walk on the beach without stepping on them. Um, <laughs> so uh, this was, uh, does, it, does it say where? Drake's Beach in Northern California. I don't know how far that is from San Francisco, but I could imagine the San Francisco boys having a fun old time down there. Uh, anyway, even when you don't see them on the beach, there's a very good chance that there are many uh, feet below you burrowed under the sand during storms. The layers of sand that were once covering them are washed out to sea, leaving the innkeepers, the innkeepers exposed to predators, including seagulls, sharks, stingrays, and other fish. Some cultures also see the strange fish as a delicacy. In South Korea, for example, the dish known as gay bull, gay bull, yeah, you heard me right, um, <laughs> of course, the strange phallic, phallic appearance of the fat innkeeper seems to attract far more attention than many other sea creatures that wash up on shore throughout the year. Researchers estimate that an individual fat innkeeper can live for up to 25 years if they manage to avoid predators. As a species, uh, as a species fossil evidence shows these creatures may have been around for over 300 million years. Now, apparently otters really like this thing. There's a video included here uh, in this that I'm not going to share with you, but uh, from some, some uh, tori tourist company. Um, that you, you might find interesting to watch, um, but uh, yeah, there's a there's a ton of these fat innkeepers there, uh, on or penis fish. <laughs> <coughs> so I find it humorous. Thank you for that, Cowboy Tech. I do believe it was you that shared that there in the chat yesterday. <laughs> Oh man! Now this, I, 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 I don't know what to make of it. I, 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 other than it's probably true. Other than it's probably true, and I, I just, I, because, wow, 
two percent of the of the total U.S. exports. That's a lot of money, right? I mean, two percent. How much would you figure that is in dollars? Two percent of the total U.S. export from NationalFile.com. Shocking. Blood of poor Americans now comprises 2% of total U.S. export. 2%. Poor Americans. The blood of poor Americans. America is one of the leading first world countries to export their citizens' blood. Around 70% of global plasma comes from the United States. 16.3% or $1.4 billion worth of all blood exported in 2018 came from the United States, placing them second in the global ranking with Ireland at number one, boasting a shocking 37.8%. And between 2014 and 2018, the U.S. posted an increase of 165.4% according to World's Top Exports, which is a website. Um, perhaps the most shocking comes the revelation that the total dollar worth of all American blood extracted at the source is around 2% of the total country's total exports. Plasma is one of the primary focuses in blood extraction. Given its function in transporting proteins and red and white blood cells around the body, a 2015 article for The Atlantic says it is legal to donate plasma up to two times a week, for which a bank will pay you 30 bucks per pop, a pop. Somebody who donates plasma on such a regular basis would find themselves donating over 100 times a year, making around $3,000. However, donating plasma on such a frequent basis can adversely affect the health of the donor or seller with around 70% of the donors experiencing health issues. Donors tend to have a lower protein count, which can lead to several forms of health complications. Uh, according to Mint Press News, respondents all agree that they were indeed being exploited, but in more ways than one. Desperate Americans are allowed to donate twice a week, 104 times a year, but losing that much plasma could have serious health consequences, most of which have not been studied, uh, Professor Schaefer warns, stressing that more research is necessary. Around 70% of donors experience health complications. Donors have a lower protein count in their blood, putting them at a greater risk of infections and liver and kidney disorders. Many regulars suffer from near-permanent fatigue and are borderline anemic. All this for an average of 30 bucks a visit. Rachel described the terrible Catch-22 many of the working poor find themselves in. I got turned away twice, once for being too dehydrated and once for being anemic. Being poor created a shitty paradox where I couldn't eat, and because I, I couldn't eat, my iron levels weren't high enough to allow me to donate. This was a week of pay cut, buddy. I desperately needed for rent and bills and meds. Now, according to Boing Boing, blood by total value extracted now accounts for 2% of the country's exports, more than corn or soy. It was also discovered that a third of the people who sell their blood make a, around a third of their income of, uh, from blood selling, pointing to a wider social, social issue. Yeah, if they're making, if they donate a hundred times a year at thirty dollars a pop, and they make uh, three thousand dollars, and that's a third of their income, that means they're making nine thousand dollars total a year. In spite of systemic social issues, according to the Red Cross, only thirty-eight percent of Americans are even eligible to give blood. While uh, and while four point five million Americans will require blood transfusion every year. Uh, or one American in every in every two seconds will require blood. Much of that blood is sold, uh, which is sold, is destined for abroad. The vampiric practice has hit many struggling Americans hard. To some, selling blood has become 
a form of employment. <sighs> it's an assembly line to extract liquid gold from human minds. Not minds, minds like a mine. Yeah, so, uh, 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 yeah, exactly, Frumpy. He says, I wonder how many folks are unwilling donators. Right, that's, uh, yeah, man, that, 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 that is messed up stuff there. So, uh, it's just, it's just another way to, uh, take advantage of poor people, of course. I mean, these, these guys are poor, they're desperate. Now, I, I don't know, you know, if they check them for drugs or alcohol or other things like that, disease, I would assume, I, I don't know, but, uh, wow. All right, let's play some more music. <laughs> Enough of that craziness <laughs> for now. Wow. All righty. Y'all ready for some uh, book of tea? Book of tea. <laughs> oh, boy, where is it? Here it is. <laughs> Sometimes I can't find my camera. All right. Okay, not sure what that was there. Oh, that was a Hansel request. This video says it was five minutes, but it cut off about four minutes and 15 seconds there. Uh, Hans, that was called uh, Ear Splitten Loudon Boomer Steppenwolf. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's accurate or not. Uh, before that, we had a little bash up there. Cool in the gang and Quiet Riot doing Bang Your Head. It's a celebration. I love those mashups. I hope you all have like the mashups like I do. And we kicked it off with Booker T and the, the MGs uh, do it. Green onions. Those are the only onions that I like. The ones that are musical. I don't. I don't want to hear any actual or sample any actual onions. But uh, the green onions there from Booker T. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> oh man. <I> tell you. <laughs> Uh, crazy, crazy, crazy. Ear splitting loud and boomer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> God. So, uh, yeah, thanks, so really, for the request. And uh, I, I often come across things in the request list. I have no idea what they're all about, but uh, I'll, I'll play them. I'll play them. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, lots of dead voters everywhere. Let's see. Uh, Hans puts in a link here. Lawsuit. More than 2,500 dead people are registered to vote in Detroit. Yeah! Why, and why not? And why not? <laughs> I, I mean, you know, you got pretty much got to be a, a, a zombie. Am I? Am I? Am I not on my? Did I not switch cameras back? I did not. All right. Derp or derp. <laughs> yeah, you got to be a zombie to vote. So um, you're pretty much dead to vote anyway, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Somebody posted this link in the chat earlier. I already had the link in my list, though, so I'm going to share it with you because. Uh, uh, I forget who posted it. Maybe Cowboy Tech, maybe Java Doctor. I think it was Java Doctor posted this link in the chat. Anyway, it's, it's from blacklistednews.com, uh, posted a couple days ago. The FBI teams up with the post office to get your fingerprints. Ah, lovely. Just freaking lovely. <laughs> mm. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is teaming up with the, quote, Highly efficient, unquote. <laughs> yeah. Uh, post office to make sure they've got your fingerprints. Even though it wasn't that long ago that people were warned sharing their DNA with ancestry sites. Uh, they still did. It seems they might have reason to be concerned now about the FBI's desire to snag your fingerprints, too. 
Now the government has announced a new program in which they hope people will voluntarily give their fingerprints. As the public has become more aware of such privacy concerns, it seems strange that on Friday the Federal Bureau of Investigation announced a new partnership with the U.S. Postal Service where customers can voluntarily provide them with their fingerprints while you're at the post office. Now, I, yeah, highly exacto mundo. Uh, I, I just earlier this week watched a, uh, a little series on uh, Amazon, and it's called Dystopia. And what it's about is there's this company, BioCore, that develops this uh, implantable chip which will cure not just cancer, but all your other diseases as well. It cures everything with a little side effect that it makes everybody sterile. And so after they implanted this chip in everybody around the world because it was compulsory, <laughs> this, this is a weird little thing, a little uh, like news clip at the beginning of it, from 20, the year 2017 when they implanted these chips to everybody around the world, which changed from voluntary to compulsory. Uh, anyway, so they implant this chip in everybody around the world, and then no more babies are born. Boom. And the movie starts off in 2037, uh, and it's it's a total dystopian nightmare, of course. And these uh, some scientist guys... Uh, we're trying to develop a, tele a, trans or a teleportation machine, and it turned out instead to be a time machine. And they decided they would travel back to um, uh, to 2017 and take care of this before it happened. Oh, the, the, the implantations were done in 2021. Oh, by the way, December 12th, 2021. So just bear that in mind, that if in a couple of years uh, you hear about this implantable chip, that can cure all disease, um, don't get it! <laughs> it was an interesting little little show, but the real goal behind this implantable chip was not so much to cure your disease, but it was to track every person everywhere they were at all times, which is what it did. It also did cure the disease. Oh, yeah, it did cure the disease, but it saw pregnancy also as a disease. So, that's it. No more babies after 20, 2021. So, <laughs> anyway. It's, it's, on, it's also on Tubi. Uh, Tubi TV. So, you can, you can check out Dystopia over there. Um, and, by the way, don't if you, if you look on Tubi, and you'll see, hey, there's a, a movie called Dystopia, and a series uh, called Dystopia, don't watch the movie. The movie is simply the last two episodes of the series, which you'll get totally out of context without the without the, the, the previous episodes. So uh, just look for it over there uh, if you're interested in that kind of uh, dystopian nightmare reality type stuff. All right. <laughs> so here it is. Uh, um. For a fee, the FBI can provide individuals with identity history summary, often referred to as a criminal history record or rap sheet. Identity history record or summary, which is a criminal history or a rap sheet. Uh, but there are ways to get this information without giving your fingerprints to the FBI. In fact, most of it is public record anyway. Uh, perhaps the most insidious part of the deep state the FBI is trusted in this country about as much as an uncooked pork sandwich, um, according to Rand Paul. Uh, anyway, so just uh, don't be voluntarily giving up your fingerprints. Are you stupid? <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> All right, all right. <laughs> okay, a couple weeks or several weeks ago, I don't know exactly when it was, I talked about a story where this guy was uh, transporting through the state of New York there, or the city of New York, I should say, um, hemp. 
fully legal, absolutely legal hemp, with all of the paperwork and everything. And they took the guy and they arrested him. They said, this is pot. We know this is pot. This ain't hemp. But then they proved or had to come up with the idea <laughs> that, that, that it was hemp. Uh, Hansel says that he they already have his fingerprints, but he used my name. Great. So I'll be known as a as a, one of the government goons, huh? That's, that's just wonderful. <laughs> All right, so now the NYPD has finally decided to drop the the case against the hemp dealer, which was not actually the driver of the truck, but the uh, owner of the company, the guy was driving the truck for. But they may, probably will, keep his hemp. Very nice of them, isn't it? Yeah, the NYPD's case against the hemp wholesaler went up in smoke on Tuesday. But what happens to the confiscated pot of pot? Not pot, hemp. Now is anyone's guess. So, but they call it pot because it's New York Post. So they want you to make you think it's the devil's lettuce. Uh, yeah. The Brooklyn DA's office told a judge that it was dropping all six felony drug trafficking charges against the middleman peddler. He he was a distributor. He was not uh, a... Uh, yeah, I'll get to that. Uh, uh, the, the company Green Angel CBD. Because of what cops thought was 106 pounds of illicit pot was actually legal hemp. At the time of last month's bust, the police department crowed about the arrest, even tweeting a photo of the mounds of confiscated greenery along with two cops from Brooklyn's 71st Precinct saying, Great job for Daytour Sector E. They were able to confiscate 106 pounds of marijuana, according to the tweet, and arrest the uh, individual associated with the intended delivery, the department glowed. That tweet, however, has since been deleted. Prosecutor Kerry Rowe told Judge Raymond Rodriguez on Tuesday the people have been presented with evidence that the substance seized in this case was less than 0.6% THC, which makes the substance legal hemp under federal and now state law. THC is tetrahydrocannabinol, one of the chemicals in marijuana that produces its high, the THC, yes. We love the THC. The new law places the development and enforcement of regulations pertaining to hemp squarely in the jurisdiction of the Department of Agriculture. In light of this, we consider this case to be more appropriately dealt with as a regulatory than a criminal matter, uh, the ADA said. According, accordingly, pursuant to prosecutorial discretion, we move to dismiss the charges in this case, never admitting that they were just totally wrong. Still, while the prosecutor said her office has no use for the hemp, estimated it being worth up to 60 grand on the retail market by Green Angel, she said the NYPD would hold on to it, at least for now, because the substance appears to have been imported outside of New York's regulatory guidelines, the release of property would be a determination to be made by the NYPD in consultation with the Department of Agriculture. Prosecutors and cops say Green Angel did not have a required permit for the product. The assertion infuriated Green Angel's owner, Orrin Levy, and his lawyer who got into a shouting match uh, with the DA office spokesman outside of court. The DA rep... Orin Yaniv said that by law, all processors need to have a license and your client doesn't have a license. Green Angel lawyer Michael R. Bitt retorted, he's a, wholesale, he's a wholesaler. Processor means farmer. We're, <laughs> they're, 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 they're conflating ter terms here, trying to call a wholesaler a processor, which he is not. Uh, we're not guessing. We know it. It's over anyway. Um, so the NYPD said in a statement to the Post, uh, still insisted that the plants were illegal marijuana, 
saying in New York State, hemp sale and possession distribution is only permissible when the buyer and seller have the proper permissions from the authority of the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. In this case, neither the seller nor the buyer had those permissions. Uh, scumbags. Total douchebag scumbag pieces of crap. Hey, Sark, how you doing? <laughs> oh, man, I, I tell you, it's just fucking stupid. And, uh, it, it's infuriating to a large degree. What now? Camel toe coffee? What? <laughs> I'm not sure what she's talking about. <laughs> oh, man. Some people. Some people are really desperate for children. I don't understand it, but then again, I've never been real fond of children. I, I don't like them. They're they make a lot of noise. They smell bad. They, they 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 destroy things. I'm not a fan of children, just in general, you know. Um, so I so I don't really understand the thought process that gets somebody to want to have children. I, I know it's 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 I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cruel bastard uh, as far as children are concerned. Uh, but anyway, a lot of people do decide they want to have children, and a lot of people. Uh, will will um, take their sperm or embryos and have them frozen uh, for for later usage because maybe they maybe they they don't want to uh, have them right away but they're going to want them you know five ten years down the road uh, so apparently bad idea babies born from IVF using frozen embryos may be more than twice as likely to get childhood cancer. Yet, more than one million children in Denmark were included in the study. Frozen embryo babies made up 0.3% of the children, but 06 of the cancer patients. Experts suggest the freezing and thawing process could cause genetic change. You think? <laughs> Babies born from frozen embryo IVF may be more likely to get childhood cancer. Uh, data from the more than 1 million children show they, they were 154% more likely to develop cancer than those born to fertile mothers. Among children whose mothers conceived naturally, there were 17.5 cases of cancer per 100,000 children. 17.5. The figure was 44.4 per 100,000 from frozen IVF babies. That's significant. The work did not find IVF itself led to any greater risk of cancer, such as leukemia, as well as brain and spine tumors. The link only existed for frozen embryos. Scientists suggest the fact that freezing and thawing the embryos, as well as the chemicals used in the process, could contribute to genetic changes which later lead to cancer. Although the risk increased significantly, it remained low, and just about 0.4% of all frozen embryo babies developed cancer. Still, quite significantly higher than the non-frozen embryo babies. Experts said the risk is so small that the study should not worry parents or couples. Oh, right, nice experts. And added freezing methods have improved since the research was done. So, uh, yeah, don't you worry. You got, you got to have a freeze dry, freeze dried child. It's it's like coffee, you know, freeze dried or coffee, except it's a it's a child, freeze dried baby. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but I mean, come on. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> All right, I wasn't even going to get into this, but let's do it anyway. I didn't want to talk about this guy. That's not the right one. How did I do that one? That's the wrong one. I clicked the wrong link. There it is. 
Let's see, close that one. All right. I, I, I said I didn't want to talk about this guy. I don't really care. I mean, we all know what a scumbag he was and what a, a list of other scumbags that he had and all the terrible things. But I found this title, anyway, interesting. <laughs> because if it's true, does it make a difference? Uh, is it something that you may, may not have expect, suspected anyway? <laughs> On TruePundit.com, Epstein was a Mossad agent used to blackmail American politicians, former Israeli spy claims. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Jeffrey Epstein was a Mossad asset who was used by Israeli intelligence to blackmail American politicians, according to the former Israeli spy. Ari ben Menashe, a former Israeli spy and alleged handler of Robert Maxwell, told the authors of a new book, Epstein, Dead Men Tell No Tales, that Epstein read a, ran a complex intelligence operation at the behest of Mossad. <laughs> Believing that Epstein planned to marry his daughter, Maxwell introduced him to Ghislaine Maxwell, a, a, to, to him and Ghislaine Maxwell, to Ben Menashe's Mossad circle. Maxwell sort of started liking him, and my theory is that Maxwell felt that this guy was going for his daughter. Uh, he felt that he could bless him with some work and help him out in like uh, in like a paternal. What? That doesn't make sense. Pronounce. Get your sentences right. Israeli intelligence bosses gave the green light, and Epstein then became a Mossad asset. They were agents of the Israeli intelligence services, said Ben Benashi. When it became clear uh, that Epstein wasn't very competent at doing much else, his primary role became blackmailing American and other political figures. <laughs> so there you have it. Epstein, a Mossad agent, Specifically used to um, <laughs> specifically used to blackmail American politicians. <laughs> I, I I couldn't tell you whether any of that's true or correct, but it's an interesting little read. <laughs> there is more to the story if you decide to click through and go over to Zero Hedge on that, but uh, I think that's plenty. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that's plenty. <laughs> All right, I got some more stuff, but we'll get to that when we come back. We're going to play some more music right here. Um, and, yes, it does make perfect sense, uh, Mr. Works. Um, I <laughs> oh, God. But it wasn't just, of course, American politicians. It was pe uh, uh, political higher-ups around the world uh, were, 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 could easily be blackmailed because they're all a bunch of freaking pedos. So, you know, simple, simple. All right, let's kick it off with a little Black Angels for y'all. I love the Black Angels, great band, and this video is fucking awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. Smoking. Shredding the Samantha Fish there uh, with Victoria Smith and Danny Wilde doing Runaway. Uh, yeah, it's a few years old, but man, yeah, that, that's great stuff. Before that, we had Gary Moore in uh, Phil Lenat doing Out in the Field. Phil Lenat, um, yeah, he's good. Uh, also, uh, Gary, Gary Moore, I'm uh, un un unbeatable. Kicked it off there with the Black Angels and uh, Don't Play With Guns. A little Illuminati stuff going on in that vid, man. Uh, that, that, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a great vid. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy, they uh, they have some fun. <laughs> it's been a while since I've heard anything new out of the Black Angels, which is a shame because I really dig that band. Um, but, you know, it happens. That's what happens. Yeah, yummy Sammy. Yummy Sammy. 
<laughs> God, yeah, she is a she is a tasty morsel, to say the least. And she can sing well, and she plays guitar like a monster. So man, that's a, a how do you how do you go wrong? I just I just I just I just don't know uh, with that one. So. Uh, which one do we want here? It's, it's always a tough pick. Which one do we want? I think we'll go with this one. <laughs> All right. So, let's see, two, six, uh, five is eleven. 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 Uh, all right. So we got a few minutes. All right. So let's see where we are at now at this point. Everything going? Everything going. All right. Good. Okay. What else do I got for you? Oh. No, I'll save that one for another time. I think that's that's a better one for a, for a leftovers show. Which, by the way, if you're unaware, if you uh, weren't around at the end of Grib Leftovers or didn't hear the uh, rebroadcast uh, podcasting, um, Monday I'm going to do a Grim Leftovers show, but then I'll take off. The, the next two weeks uh, for the rest of the year. So, uh, and we'll come back in 2020. 2020! Can you believe it's 2020? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Let's do this one, shall we? I I am. I am. I am in love with Samantha Fish circle. I don't deny it. I don't try to hide it. <laughs> oh, I don't know if this is a good thing or not. I'm going to say probably not, but uh, <laughs> take it for what it's worth, I suppose. On Minds.com, posted up here up here by Koti Ra, C-O-T-Y-R-E-H, uh, we, I don't mean you and I, but somebody, can now reproduce inanimate objects like living organisms. Imagine if inanimate objects were like living organisms in the sense that their container, they contained their own assembly and operating instructions in the form of DNA. You could sample the genetic code of a chair and clone it, for example. It turns out we are on the verge of doing just that. A team of scientists at East Zurich devised a DNA of things storage architecture to produce materials with immutable memory. This approach allows us to integrate uh, the instructions for how to 3D print an object in the materials of the object itself. It's not as far-fetched as it sounds. Here's how it works. The 3D printing instructions are encoded as a strand of DNA. The DNA is stored in in glass nanobeads, which are fused into the materials for printing or casting the object in it, objects in any shape. The printed object now carries its own instructions for producing another copy. You can then repo remove a piece of that object and retrieve these instructions to print another and on down the line. The team practiced this technique by printing a plastic rabbit. Their rabbit contained 45 KB, a tiny amount, of digital DNA blueprint for its synthesis. They successfully synthesized five generations of the rabbit, each from the memory of the previous generation, without additional DNA synthesis or degradation of information. DNA of Things has many other potential applications, including st uh, storing electronic health records and in medical implants and hiding data in everyday objects. This breakthrough puts us in the beginning stages of building self-replicating machines. Let me stop there. <laughs> Let me stop there. Any of you that ever watched the uh, television series Stargate SG-1 into the later uh, seasons, episodes, 
you saw these these things called replicators, which is basically what they're describing here. And the replicators had one sole purpose, to replicate, to continue making more of themselves. And they would use whatever materials were available wherever they were to do it. They destroyed civilizations. <laughs> and they were very, very difficult to stop. Uh, so, yeah. is this a good thing? <laughs> I don't know. Of course, Stargate SG-1 was a sci-fi show. <laughs> but it sounds exactly like what they are doing right here. <sighs> All right. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff I could talk about. Most of it's going to take a little too long. Uh, I'll just give you this one, just for the just for the joke of it. Uh, Project Looking Glass is about Stargates. Actual Stargates, where you could travel through a wormhole to a distant part of the galaxy or to other galaxies if you had the proper Stargate. Hmm, interesting. Okay, this is on DISRN.com. Snopes contacts the White House after Trump retweets a Babylon Bee story. <laughs> so the quote unquote fact checking website Snopes contacted the White House after President Trump retweeted his story from the popular satirical outlet the Babylon Bee uh, Snopes uh, Dan Ivan who has previously collided with the Babylon Bee when he assigned nefarious motives to the satirical Bee article in a supposedly objective fact check, prompting a threat of legal action from the comedy outlet. Sent his concerns to the White House in an email uh, reviewed by DIRSN, which read in part, President Trump recently retweeted a post from Jenna Ellis Esquire containing a fake quote from an entertainment article. Was President Trump aware of this? <laughs> the quote was fake when he said it? If so, was it, wasn't it accompanied by a message labeling the quote as fiction? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you can read the rest of that for yourself. It's pretty stupid and pretty funny. Um, but, uh, you know, <laughs> stupid ass Snopes. Unbelievable. All right, let's do the last set here, uh, and then we'll come back and uh, say goodnight and all that wonderful stuff that we do uh, here on the Freakers Balls to the Wall type show. Um, so, uh, y'all remember this song, I'm sure. Yeah, Black Betty. <laughs> Stoner Trade, Stoner Trade there. Uh, I love that version of Black Betty. Uh, I like most of them, but you know, that one's really cool. Uh, but we, before that, we had uh, Leo Maraccioli covering the Beatles, Obladi, Oblada. And if you want some fun, sing Obladi, Blada. <laughs> Maybe we kicked it off with Nirvana, Smells Like Teen Spirit. All right, folks, that's got to wrap it up here. Uh, I've had a great time doing the show. Uh, it'll be better, I guess, next week. No, I, I remind once again, next week is is going to be the Christmas show. Get your Christmas tracks, tunes in uh, to the request list. I appreciate all those rolling in. The more, the merrier. Uh, so uh, Moose Girl will be back next week with her little elf costume on. And happy birthday once again to the Buddy Moose Girl. Also, get your predictions in. For for the for the week, you know, so we can get those in before the twenty uh, seventh. Uh, the show of the twenty seventh is when we'll review the predictions here on uh, Freakers Ball. So uh, yeah, get those in and um, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks everybody for tuning in and being part of the show, being part of Real Liberty Media, being who you are. Yeah, 
All right. Talk to you all later. Have a great weekend. Check the schedule on com for all the shows throughout the week. Peace.